I'm Linda Roth. I'm the Curator of European Decorative Arts at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. I'm going to be talking to you today about this pair of candlesticks that were made at the Sevres Porcelain Factory in France in 1827. They have a very interesting history, not only through their production at the factory, but also actually their life at the Wadsworth. In 2015, we were in the middle of, we had finished up a storage renovation of the basement storage, and, but we had a lot of things that had been moved to temporary quarters while we were doing that work. And I was in storage with Scholar looking at a pair of, at a, at a group of mice and vases. And he pointed to these candlesticks, which are incredibly dirty, that had electric fittings. And he said, well, those are Sev porcelain. And I said, really? They had been in storage since probably 1945 when they were given to us and I had never seen them up close and because they were so dirty I thought they were marble. So an embarrassed curator realized that really important pair of Sev candlesticks had been lurking in storage for over half a century. So after that I did a lot of research on them. I went to France, I spent a week actually a few days in the Sev archives and I learned quite a bit about them and so that's the information I thought we would talk about today. But we're in the conservation studio and the reason we're here is because in fact this has become a collaborative project between me and Casey Mallincrott, who you will meet in a few minutes, to try and restore and clean and bring these candlesticks back to their former glory. As I said, these candlesticks came to us in 1945. Uh, they were given by Mrs. Frances T. Maxwell, who was the widow of Frances Maxwell, who was a mill owner in the Hockenham Mill Company. They had built this enormous man mansion in Rockville, Connecticut between 1902 and 1904. And it's still there today. It's occupied by the Elks Club. So if you want to go to see the mansion of the Maxwells, you can probably call the Elks and they would probably let you in. The Maxwells were very active in Hartford society. He was a member of the Metropolitan, of the Royal Academy of Arts in London. They were members at the Wadsworth and that they had given $250 when the first annual report came out for the museum. And by 1931, they had donated over $1,000. So they were very important members of the community and they had a very, very grand home. Candlesticks in this style would have fit in beautifully to their home. The model for this candlesticks are called Candelabra Antique. And they were originally made, the model was originally designed for and made for Napoleon I for his personal private dinner service. And they were really part of a large Surtou, so a, a table centerpiece which comprised many pieces and they were, the model was originally all white. So this is unglazed porcelain that uh, was really a specialty of the Sev factory. They were used for the first time on 18, in 1810 on the occasion of Napoleon's second marriage to Marie Louise and they were part of this elaborate setting and we actually can see them in a painting tucked away behind very elaborate gilded uh, dinner service. So it was very grand. There are, there's a pair in the Louvre that may or may not have been part of the original service. And also in the Louvre, there are other elements from the service, this grand center of the centerpiece, which is Napoleon in a chariot. So grandiose self-aggrandizement, this was all about Napoleon. So once the candlesticks were made for the Napoleon service, they were put into production on a limited basis. And we know that seven pairs uh, were recorded in the records at the factory archives from 1812 to 1830. And this pair was made in 1827. And I found it in the records for the gilder, whose name is Miko. And we see that in his marks, which are on both candlesticks and one of the candlesticks has a factory mark also for 1827 period which is between the reign of Charles X who reigned from 1824 to 30. So these were made during Charles 
Charles's reign and gilded by this uh, very important gilder named Miko. Our pair of candlesticks were actually part of a large service of 86 plates that feature images of all of the different regions of France. And the factory actually made the service on spec in a way. They were hoping that Charles X would purchase it to celebrate his coronation in 1825. But unfortunately, he wasn't really interested in buying this very expensive service. So it sort of sat around. It wasn't finished then, but the work kept happening. They kept making the plates, and they actually then made the candlesticks in 1827. And they hoped that maybe after Charles X left the throne and Louis Philippe assumed the throne, that Louis Philippe would be interested in the service, but he wasn't. And so it sat unsold until 1848, which is when Louis Philippe abdicated the throne, at which time it was delivered to the president of the National Assembly in France. Unfortunately, they didn't really want to pay for it. So it was returned to the factory in 1850 for a simpler service, and it didn't really find a home until it was sent off to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1852. And by this time, the candlesticks were not with the service. And this is all of the information that we can find in the factory archives, which makes it really exciting. The original service, as I said, included a pair of these candlesticks, but by the time it got sent to the National Assembly in 1848, another pair had been added and this pair was made in 1830 and we found them in the records but we don't know where they are. So the long story short is that sometime after 1850 or 52 when they were delivered to the foreign ministry they must have been sold by the Sev factory as independent candlesticks but we have no record of that sale. So as I said the original pair made for Napoleon's service was all white but the candlesticks that were made for this service de département have this wonderful gilding of the oak leaves. And the second pair of candlesticks, the 1830 pair, also had gilding. But as far as I can tell from the records, I'm not sure there are any other pairs that were gilded. Uh, so this makes them also very rare and unique. Hi, welcome to the conservation studio. I'm Casey Mallinckrodt. I'm the objects conservator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And I'm delighted to be in the studio today with Linda Roth talking about these very interesting and complicated Sev candlesticks. As the conservator, I'm going to take you through the structure of the objects, the surface, the condition they're in, and then how that helps the curator understand what is actually here and helps me as a conservator in inter interacting with the curator understand what areas and directions of research I might go that would help inform what the curator knows about these objects. So as you know, they're hard paste porcelain and they are cast, they're, they're formed from a mold, cast in multiples and then fired in a kiln in, multiple, in multiples. And they're also in several pieces. So there is this, which is called the paraquette, and Linda's gonna correct me if I said that wrong. And then these different sections, these four different sections of the column, the foot, and then this base. And these are all cast, and they are all gilded, and also they have platinum gilding on them. These pieces are adhered together in some sections, with a kind of granular, um, almost like a, a softer ceramic. I haven't analyzed it yet. It's deteriorated in some of the joins and it is um, still robust in others. In general, in conservation, we want to take the, the least uh, invasive route. Everything that we do by our ethics needs to be reversible or retreatable by a conservator in the future. So, it's my goal to do as little as possible and at the same time bring these back to the condition they would have been in when they were created. So as a conservator, I'm going through this object trying to figure out ever more about what it is and there are many different ways that we go about doing that. The first is observation. We take many photographs so we can compare before and after. I observe it and in some cases photograph it in UV, which uh, ultraviolet light, which helps identify areas where there's an added material or um, an adhesive. We also have x-radiography, so we can take x-rays of the object. 
And that was a particular interest in trying to understand how these are constructed um, because there's a metal rod that runs through these. It holds the pieces, it's, there's a screw at the bottom that holds the pieces, holds the iron rod in place, and then it screws into this configuration at the top. But it doesn't come up above this point. It's, it's, it just doesn't. And um, that makes it challenging to think about removing it and considering what's inside. I x-rayed it and found out that this rod has a metal plate right in the middle of it that's large enough that it won't slip through the end. And if I show you this section, um, you can see that it narrows down and has a small aperture. So this is one way that the object was protected from falling apart and also allowed the top component to be mechanically attached. We need to figure out what that original top configuration was because it wasn't the light fixture. Um, another thing that I can, a tool that I can use in analysis is our uh, XRF spectrometer. This is an, a machine that uses x-rays in a different way to determine the elemental composition of uh, many, many materials. And in the case of ceramics, it can tell the percentage of different minerals that are part of that ceramic paste. Through that information, we can then go back to the records that might have been kept by the manufacturing institution, like SEV, research that other conservators and conservation scientists have done, and determine also whether there's a difference between these two. And in the course of our investigation, Linda actually observed that there are quite distinct differences between the paraquettes of these two. And I have done some analysis of the XRF analysis of the paste of those two, and there's a little bit of difference. I've taken x-rays of the two of them to compare them, and one, the, this one is considerably denser paste than that one. So there is some chemical difference between the two. You can tell from looking at them the con that the condition of these is um, problematic. They're extremely dirty. There are cracks. Many of these um, acanthus leaves have broken off, and all of the ones that have broken off have been very badly reattached. Um, and with a mysterious mix of adhesives. So I've been, of course, documenting where all of those breaks and cracks are. And also, before we start into something like trying to take off or reverse a, a bad attachment or a reverse um, an unsightly attachment, something that's out of alignment, we need to understand what will break that adhesive down. So I'll do solvent tests to figure out whether it's soluble in water or acetone or mineral spirits. Some of these attachments are, have been done with some pretty robust adhesives, probably modern epoxies, and that will be a bit trickier to reverse. One of the great challenges of this project is to clean this hard paste porcelain back to the whiteness that was intended originally. Linda's striving for in realizing her curatorial objectives. One of the difficulties of cleaning a material like this is that it can absorb oils. It can be really deeply stained by organic materials and atmospheric materials that have accumulated over many years. So I've been working at having actually quite a good time. So I've been testing different ways of pulling the soiling off without allowing it to soak further into the porcelain and have found that I need to use a series of, of cleansing agents, a chelating agent for one, which is a, a, kind of a kind of molecule that will attach to a metal ion and remove it. And that's really helpful for any kind of minerals that are in the, or metals that are in atmospheric pollution. A very mild soap, water, and one of conservators' all-time backup materials, which is spit, which is a mildly enzymatic solution that removes a lot of things that water just won't quite use. What, excuse me, that water won't quite remove. But I've been very satisfied in finding that we're able to go from this very grimy surface, and this was even grimier than this one, more along the lines of this very dark here, to um, something that's quite close. We're not there yet, but it's quite close to the white surface that is going to be the final product. 
we talked earlier about this globe that had been added, probably, I would think, maybe even by the Maxwells, but certainly um, much later, late 19th century, I really didn't um, think about, I haven't really tried to pinpoint when they, they would have uh, been added, but they're not an integral part of uh, the candlesticks. Nobody drilled any holes to electrify them, so we're very fortunate, and uh, we will be removing them and putting them in a bag in storage, properly marked so that they're always associated with this pair of candlesticks like we do in museums, but they really don't have anything to do with what these were meant to look like. Um, and so we, they really don't belong no. on the candlesticks no. going forward. And one of the things we'll have to figure out is what the original um, stop was on the top because you know this just the metal rod just comes up through the top if it doesn't have you know it has this electrical fixture to add into now so. right and what i think it might have been but i need to do more research is like a spike like a spike that you could then put your candle mm -hmm. attach your candle with and i have a recollection of seeing uh, one pair with spikes on them, um, maybe one of the ungilded ones, but that's more research that I still have to do. And I would have to confirm that those, the ones that I'm remembering in my head, were not later editions. So we still have work to do. I certainly have work to do. Tie up a few loose ends mm -hmm. uh, curatorially about these candlesticks. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if I can find evidence of any wax on the interiors of these two paraquettes as well, because that would be evidence that they'd actually been used as candlesticks instead of just decorative. Right. So suggested. And, but I would wonder when that would have happened, because it's unclear as well. We don't really have documentation of whether the, they were used when they went to the National Assembly. We just know that uh, they had them for a couple of years and then they decided to return the service because it was too expensive and they didn't want anything as expensive. And then we know they were sent to the, and when, they, when the service went to the foreign ministry, the candlesticks weren't with them. So we don't really have a, any documentation that would suggest that at least in there through 1848 or 1850 that they were actually used. But I'm not sure we could find out that information. But it, you know, it's really worth looking to see if there was any wax any. residue. I would be a little surprised, but yeah. you know, it would be really interesting to know. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we did discover, and Casey alluded to it, is we, we noticed differences between uh, these pieces. Uh, she re keeps referring to them as paraquette, which in French is parrot. And I didn't understand why they were being called parrot. I found this description in the archives when they were uh, documenting the work done by the gilder Miko. And so it, none of it made any sense to me. So I actually emailed the archivist, the actual retired archivist at the Sev factory who had worked there for well over 30 years. And as far as I know, knows everything about the Sev documents. She's she's been working, she worked with them for so long. And I said, what, what is this word? I know it means parrot, but that makes no sense. And she said, that actually is what they called this last sort of cup-like piece on a pair of candelabra, because it refers not just to the, to the bird parrot, but it was a French term for the part at the top of a ship's mast that the birds, the birds would stand, sit on. That reference is uh, how these, this part of the candelabras are called, which I found to be really interesting. <laughs> and I would never have understood that if I hadn't had the resources of the former archivist. Yeah. But what we did realize is that they're different. And they're different in slightly in size. They're different in weight. Mm -hmm. And they're different in quality. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it has really, and maybe Casey, yeah. you can show the, also the attachment difference. Oh, yes. There's also a slight difference in the attachment because there's this platinum, like there's a platinum attachment here, but then there's an additional one here mm -hmm. that doesn't exist on mm -hmm. uh, the other candlestick. And... And this one has been broken off, been sh sort of 
chipped off. Right. Uh, and it looks, even though it looks accidental, in some ways, because it's uneven, it, I, it seems as though it was done intentionally to kind of change the design a bit. So it really has led us to conclude that the paraquette mm -hmm. and this whole, this whole piece is a replacement that must have been required when the original was broken. Mm -hmm. And what Casey and I would love to know, but whether or not we will ever know, is sort of the date-ish of mm -hmm. when this was replaced. Mm -hmm. My guess is before the Maxwells bought it. Mm -hmm. So these are, this is one of the things that we've discovered, which was really quite fun and exciting. Would it have been made at a different factory? Were there were replacements made at different factories? Yes, there were sale? a lot of factories in France that could have made a replacement for it. Uh, my guess is that if it had been made at the Sev factory as a replacement, it wouldn't look so different. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it was made at another factory. There were tons of small factories in Paris, and then there was a whole industry by this time in Limoges, France, uh, the center of hard paste porcelain world in um, in France. One of the other things that we discovered as we were examining this paraquette is underneath the one on this candlestick, here. and we put it back together for this program so that you could see it with the, the electrification. But what we found was very well-defined incised marks, and they would have been put in by the man at the factory called the repairer who worked on the candlesticks uh, before they were all put together and he would have been one of the people who would either have done the sort of cleanup work after things get, came out of the mold to you know make sure that the carving was nice and crisp and then he would have also been involved in putting the pieces together and at the time they would have been probably adhered to each other with a liquid slip so it's in a sense it's the it's the paste mm -hmm but in a more liquid form. Yeah. And so his initials and, and the date of, I think it's probably November of, of 1827, are carved underneath the paraquette of this one. So it also uh, reaffirms the fact that this is original, whereas this one is not. The process of getting these to the point of completion and is com the point of completion of their treatment will involve casting the pieces that have been either lost or poorly realigned so that there's a piece missing. Say in here there's about a quarter inch missing that's going to have to be replaced. This will be come off and this will be realigned. The cracks will be realigned and fixed and I can also add that say this there's a large gap here. This piece was lost, and that will be cast off of the other side of this so that it'll, it'll really look very cohesive as it was when it was completed and uh, using this sort of conservation model of being able to well, document everything so it'll be very clear what was done, what materials were used, how to reverse it, but it won't be, it'll be seamless for the viewer. And they will glow <laughs> with the wonderful contrast of the whiteness of the porcelain and the really beautiful gilding that is yeah. in surprisingly good condition in many places. I should note that even in the records, it's called matte gilding. Hmm. So it was, it was meant to be this very matte finish um, and not a bright, bright, shiny finish. Mm -hmm. So but it really, it, I think it will, they'll turn into out to be really quite beautiful mm -hmm. and then I will find a place for them in the galleries. I chose these candlesticks for this artful conversation because it's so interesting having worked here the many decades that I've worked here that after all these years we can still make incredible discoveries especially because we're such an old institution and we have all of we have so many things that are still in storage waiting to be sort of discovered and found. 
and loved again. And I've been wanting to do something with these candlesticks since we discovered them in 2015. But we, at the time, didn't have a conservator on staff who, who specialized in objects. You know, we had a paintings department, but we didn't have a conservation department that embraced objects as well. And so with Casey's arrival, I said, oh, well, I have a project that I'd really like to start with you. And so we brought these up to the studio, and it just became apparent that there were lots of stories to tell. And uh, we wanted to s celebrate this really wonderful discovery that had been at least hiding from my plain sight for a, you know, half a century.